we've all heard of the famous story of the sinking of the Titanic. But if you really think about it, it's not just one story, but so many stories all at once. It is a story of strength and courage, as with the likes of Margaret Brown stepping in to help passengers in need. It is a story of luck and guile, like with Arthur John Priest, a man who not only survived the Titanic, but also three other tragedies at sea. It is a story of perseverance and intrigue, as with Violet Jessup, a stewardess who had also survived three shipwrecks and then continued to serve for 30 more years after that. These are the stories of their personal journeys. When the RMS Titanic set sail from England on April 10, 1912, it was the largest ship ever built at its time. It was 883 feet long and 175 feet tall, and it took 3,000 workers 26 months to build it. Considered to be the pinnacle of nautical engineering, this ship was touted by its makers to be unsinkable. Of course, four days after its maiden voyage at sea, that claim would be proven false. On April 14th, the Titanic hit the iceberg. The collision ruptured the hull, and the 16 supposedly watertight compartments designed to keep the ship afloat quickly flooded with water. It took the liner two hours and 40 minutes to sink. And of the 2,240 passengers and crew on board, only 706 survived. One of those survivors was Margaret Brown. She was a philanthropist, an actress, who had traveled to Europe to visit her daughter in Paris. However, when Brown got word that a grandchild had fallen ill back in America, she bought a ticket for the next available ocean liner that would take her home, which just so happened to be the Titanic. As a wealthy woman, whose husband had become rich after finding gold in one of the mines that he owned, Brown was able to get first-class accommodations on the vessel. For over four days, she enjoyed many of the luxuries that came with her ticket. There were the expected services, like a large dining room with a live orchestra. But the vessel also was equipped with a gym, squash courts, and a swimming pool. And she'd spend her time in the first-class lounge that had been designed in the architectural style of the Palace of Versailles. When the Titanic started to sink, Brown could have jumped into the first available lifeboat and made her way to safety but she did not. Instead, she joined the relief efforts and helped others get out, putting her own life at risk. In fact, by some accounts, a crew member had to physically pick her up and drop her into a lifeboat, number six, in order to get her off the ship. With all the confusion and fear around, Brown went on to take control of the lifeboat. She even got the women on board to help paddle, knowing that it would help them keep warm in the cold night's air. There were also reports that she had an argument with the crewman who was in charge of that particular boat. When she suggested that they paddle toward the ship to help save others, quartermaster Robert Hitchens refused, claiming that when the massive Titanic would finally go under, their tiny lifeboat would be pulled down with it if they were too close. An hour and 20 minutes after the Titanic sank, the survivors were finally rescued by the RMS Carpathia. Even then, Brown was still hard at work, now ensuring that passengers from the second and third classes were provided with basic necessities, such as food and blankets. Initially dubbed the heroine of the Titanic, she would later be nicknamed the unsinkable Molly Brown. A bit of an odd nickname, considering that she was never called Molly in her normal life. However, her story was so compelling that it was eventually turned into a musical in 1960 and into a movie in 1964 and her character would continue to pop up in several other films about the tragedy. There was also another person on board who was also later declared unsinkable, though his series of events that led to him earning this title are far more tragic. His real name was Arthur John Priest. He worked as a stoker and fireman. This meant that he spent most of his time below deck, helping shovel coal into the furnaces that created the steam needed to keep the ship moving. It was a dirty, sweaty job, but it was also a big responsibility, as stokers had to ensure the furnaces did not overheat or set fire to the whole ship. Priest was one of the 163 stokers hired to work on the Titanic for his first big trip. He helped shovel the 600 tons of coal the engines needed each day. When the ship hit the iceberg, Priest was relaxing in the bunker he shared with his co-workers, not far from his workstation. Escape was difficult and his chances of survival were low. He had to move fast, running through corridors and 
uh, along gangplanks as he made a desperate dash onto the deck. And once there, he had only one option left, to jump into the frigid Atlantic Ocean. Imagine the shock of being enveloped by 27 degree water, surrounded by panicked screams and the darkness of the night. Despite all this, Priest swam, and swam, and remarkably, with frostbite setting in, he found safety on a lifeboat. He was one of only 44 stokers to survive. As if that wasn't enough, Priest would go on to survive three other sinking ship disasters, including the HMS Alcantara in 1916, the Titanic sister ship the Britannic, also in 1916, and then the Donegal in 1917. It was for this miraculous record that he was later known as the unsinkable stoker. After the Donegal, Priest finally retired from working on ships. Although he claimed he only did so because nobody would agree to sail with him. Now, people who had been in a shipwreck often remain afraid of water for the rest of their lives. But let me tell you a story of a woman who survived not one, not two, but three ship disasters and then continued to work on cruise liners as a stewardess. Meet Violet Jessup, Miss Unsinkable. Her childhood can be described in one word, short. Violet had to grow up very quickly to take care of her siblings. She was the oldest of nine children. Life became even more difficult when she became very ill. The doctors were sure that she wouldn't survive, but she did. Shortly after recovering, she moved to England with her mother, took care of her sisters, and attended a convent school. Her mother worked as a stewardess at sea, and when she fell sick, young Violet followed in her footsteps. But because of her youth and beauty, no one wanted to hire her, thinking that she would distract passengers and crew. But Violet didn't give up, and instead came to one of the interviews in her worst clothes and with unkempt hair. She wanted to show that she was ready for hard work on the ship. She was hired on the spot. The first two years passed uneventfully. But then, a series of incredible fortunes began, or misfortunes, depending on how you look at it. In 1910, Miss Jessup got a job on the most luxurious liner of its time, the Royal Mail Ship Olympic. This ship sailed across the Atlantic from England to America. The engineers didn't focus on the speed of this vessel, but on its comfort. While working on that ship, Jessup was paid just two pounds a month, the same as 200 pounds today. Hard work on the ship's deck from morning to night didn't frighten Jessup. She loved the job. She liked to talk to the people and enjoyed the beautiful views of the Atlantic. So on September 20th, 1911, Jessup was working on the deck as usual. The sea was calm and the weather was excellent. The ship was sailing through the Solent Strait, which separates the Isle of Wight from the British mainland. At this moment, the British military cruiser Hawk appeared ahead. It should have simply passed by the Olympic, but something went wrong. For whatever reason, the ships started going straight at each other. The Olympic's captain tried to maneuver to avoid a collision, but failed. The Hawk's bow was designed specifically to ram other ships, so when it rammed the Olympic, it made an impact. The liner shuddered, and the people screamed in fear and panic. The ship had a huge hole in the starboard. Jessup fell from the force of the blow it seemed that one of the biggest liners of its time was going to sink. But luckily, both ships stayed afloat and nobody got hurt. You would think that an accident like this would frighten Jessup, but nope, she didn't give it a second thought and it continued to work as a stewardess. In April of 1912, she decided to take a job on the best, most unsinkable ship of a time, where she was supposed to serve VIPs. Initially, she didn't want to work on this ship, only agreeing to it after much persuasion from her friends. And that's how Violet Jessup boarded the Titanic on April 10, 1912. Four days later, when the infamous iceberg collided with the ship, Jessup was resting in her cabin. She was almost asleep when she felt the jolt. Immediately, she was called to the upper deck. Surprisingly, when the Titanic first hit the iceberg, almost nobody panicked. No one could believe that the unsinkable ship could actually sink. As the ship's hold was being filled with water, everybody was just calmly carrying on about their business on the upper decks. It was only when the cabin crew started instructing passengers to reach their lifeboats that panic finally set in. 
Jessup, along with other stewards, was actively aiding the passengers' evacuation to the lifeboats. The rule was that women and children were to be evacuated first. But when many of the women hesitated to step onto the lifeboats, delaying the crew's efforts, one of the ship's officers ordered Jessup to get into a boat to show the other women it was perfectly safe. Soon, others followed, and then someone suddenly thrust a swaddled baby into her hands. Without a second thought, Jessup hugged the child to her chest to keep it warm while the Titanic was sinking. She didn't let go of the baby until her lifeboat was picked up by the Carpathia, the ship that came to the rescue. As Jessup boarded the ship with the baby, a woman ran up to her and without saying a word, snatched the child from Jessup's hands. I mean, she assumed the woman was the baby's mother, so she didn't try to get it back. She was too numb and frozen to think how strange it was this woman hadn't even said thank you for saving her baby. Many years later, Jessup would be reminded of this baby under some mysterious circumstances. After successfully surviving one of the most terrible shipwrecks in history, Jessup, of course, continued to work at sea. In 1916, she took a job as a nurse on the hospital ship Britannic, which you might remember is the sister ship to both the Olympic and the Titanic. Except this one sailed in the Aegean Sea. On November 21st, the ship was traveling down its very familiar route but on that particular day, luck was not on its side. This would become the third shipwreck Jessup will have survived. However, this rescue wasn't as easy as the previous two. After the accident, the huge Britannic began to sink quickly. It took less than an hour for the ship to completely sink. Jessup didn't have time to board a lifeboat this time, so she jumped into the cold water. There, she swam to the closest lifeboat and got on. But then everyone on the boat noticed that the ship's propellers were still working. They were spinning in the water, creating a whirlpool that was pulling the boat toward them. Jessup jumped off the boat just in time to escape the propellers, but her ordeal was far from over. While in the water, she was pulled down to the ship's keel and hit her head. The only thing that saved her from losing consciousness and probably her life was her thick hair slightly cushioning the impact. And so, Somehow, against all odds, Jessup got away from the engine and was soon picked up by another boat. For the next few years after this accident, Jessup was plagued by headaches. When she finally went to the doctor, he told her she was incredibly lucky to still be alive. The incident on the Britannic resulted in a fracture in her skull. You would think that three shipwrecks and a fractured skull would be enough to stop anyone, but not Violet Jessup. She continued to work on cruise ships until the year 1950. She even cruised on the world twice on the luxury liner Belgenland. Fortunately, the rest of Ms. Jessup's career went without any further mishaps. In 1950, she moved to Great Ashfield in Suffolk County, having worked at sea for almost 42 years. Content with her career, she settled in a large cottage built in the 16th century. But a year into her retirement, she received a strange phone call. It was late at night, and Jessup was asleep when the phone rang. She picked up the phone and heard a woman's voice on the other end. The lady didn't introduce herself and asked right away, Excuse me, was it you who saved a baby on the Titanic? Jessup answered, Yes, it was me. She laughed and hung up. <laughs> Jessup later told her friend about this strange call, she assumed that some kids were playing a joke on her, but Jessup had never told anyone about the baby before that call. And according to the old records, the only child who was on the boat with Jessup was a boy. But those same records also said that the boy had been saved by another passenger. To this day, it's still unknown who the baby that Jessup rescued was. Either way, for surviving three different wrecks on three different ships, she was aptly dubbed Miss Unsinkable. And there you have it, three incredible stories of three remarkable individuals. And there's many more like them. Stories like these prove there's a hero in all of us that can come out in unexpected circumstances. But of course, I hope you'll never need to put that theory to the test. See you next time, and uh, safe travels.
That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. Or if you want more, just click on these videos and stay on the bright side.